I want to look at two concepts with you first that I introduced at the end of the last discussion, the concept of automation and the concept of development. Let me take automation first. Recall that I said that the Industrial Revolution was the technological manifestation of the machine age view of the world. Now I took you through the development of the systems view of the world, but we didn't discuss its technological development. It's corresponding technological development. So let's take a quick look at that. It's a fascinating history which we can only look at fairly briefly, but nevertheless I think I can give you the core idea. Back about the middle of the last century, for the first time we began to use electricity as a source of energy. It had been around for about a hundred years, but it was a phenomenon of interest primarily to scientists. It wasn't looked at seriously until about the middle of the last century. Uh, when we began to use electricity as a source of power, some problems arose because you couldn't see it. So you didn't know how much of it was going through a wire, how much of it was being put out by a generator, what resistance it was meeting, or what pressure it was moving under. <coughs> it turned out that although you couldn't see it, you could feel it. But that turned out to be a very dangerous way of trying to determine how much there was. <laughs> So we developed devices to do that for us. Ohmmeters, ammeters, and, uh, voltmeters, and so on. And this was a new technology that we called instrumentation. Now there's a very interesting thing about this instrumentation. These were devices, artifacts, which did not do any work. They were not machines. See, a machine was defined, remember, as an object which is used to apply energy to matter in order to transform the matter. But that's not what an ohmmeter and an ammeter does. It doesn't apply energy to matter. What it does is generate symbols. If you look at the dashboard of your automobile, you got all sorts of instruments. Take the gas gauge. What does it do? It doesn't do any work. It generates a symbol. The symbol is the location of that little arm against the backdrop. Now that symbol represents a property of a certain object or an event. That kind of a symbol is called a datum. Therefore, instruments are data-generating machines, if we want to call them a machine. Now, when a human being generates data, what's the name of the process by which he does that? What's he doing when he's generating data? I'm sorry? No, not thought. He's observing. That's observation. See, what the gasoline gauge does for you, it's looking inside your tank and telling you what's there. When I was a kid, we didn't have gasoline gauges. My job when I was driving with my father was to jump out of the car and get that wooden stick and put it down the tank to see where the wet line came and tell him how much gas was in. And he used to tell me that before they got the idea of the stick, he used to have to take the top off and look down. And it was a little dangerous to light a match to see what was in there. <laughs> but that's the way they used to do it. The instrument <coughs> replaced the need for a person to make the observation. Okay? So these were observing devices. They were not machines in the sense of applying energy to matter. Now a little later, but very close in time, there was another invention called the telegraph. Followed shortly thereafter by the telephone, then later by the wireless, eventually radio, television, and now we have a laser and a whole new technology. But if you look at that technology, it also has the characteristic that it does no work. It is not mechanization. What does that technology do? What it does is transmit symbols. It's a symbol transmitting technology. <coughs> Now, when we transmit symbols, when people do that, we have a name for it. What do we call it? 
Communication, exactly right. These were artifacts that communicated. They didn't do work. They transmitted symbols. <coughs> now we sat around for a hundred years with these two technologies without any recognition of the fact that they were fundamentally different from mechanization. And the reason is fascinating. What was happening was that we were building a new technological base for culture that was going to rest on an arch. And the arch had three stones in it. We put the first one in, that was instrumentation. We put the second one in, and that was communication. But we had to wait a hundred years before the third one was dropped in. And that didn't occur, and there's some debate about this. Uh, there are some people who mistakenly believe that it occurred at Harvard University in 1944. That's wrong. It occurred at the University of Pennsylvania in 1946. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that was dropped in there was something called the ENIAC, developed for the Navy, by the way. What was the ENIAC? Computer. First. The first electronic digital computer. Now, what in the world was the computer? It didn't do work, doesn't apply energy to matter. What it is, is a machine which manipulates symbols. It's a symbol manipulating machine. Now, when a human being manipulates symbols in accordance with rule, because a computer doesn't manipulate them arbitrarily or randomly, it manipulates them given a program or a logic. So it's manipulating them logically. That's what we call what? Thought. That's why it came to be called a thinking machine. John Dewey wrote a book called How We Think. And it was all about the logical manipulation. Now, several interesting things began to happen as soon as the computer emerged. There was a brilliant young woman who was a professor of philosophy in one of the colleges in the Northeast who wrote a book her name, by the way, was Suzanne Langer, and it was called Philosophy in a New Key, in which she was the first one I'm aware of that observed that the new technological developments had a property in common, obviously. They all deal with symbols. And her argument was that the symbol is replacing the atom as the basic element, which leads to our understanding of nature. She hadn't correctly perceived the system movement, but what she did perceive is that we were developing a new technology which had to do with symbols rather than with matter. That led the people, now as synthetic thinking emerged, to doing a curious thing. Instead of taking these things apart by analysis, they said there's something in common with the three of them. Suppose we put the three of them together. Now you have the capacity to observe, to transmit your observations from one place to another, and to process them, data process, and transmit the results from one place to another. What kind of activity is that? We, rec we recognize we created a technology to replace the brain of man. That these three combined or a mind. We had a technology to replace the mind of man as opposed to his muscle. And that's what automation is. Automation is not a mere extension of mechanization. It is fundamentally different in character. It is directed at performing mental functions, not muscular functions. Mechanization is directed at the muscle of man, replacing man as a source of energy. Automation is directed at replacing man as a source of control. We 
which is to the systems age exactly what the Industrial Revolution was to the machine age. And it will produce a major transformation in the technological base of society, not merely of production, but of the military as well, as you are, are well aware. We are approaching a stage where people are even talking about conflict in which there will be no people. We already have tanks in development which are unmanned, aircraft which are unmanned, and so on. Automated warfare. Okay, now let's develop. Well, I said development is not the same as growth. It is very important to be aware of that difference. I found out what development was in the Army, actually, during World War II, as a result of a very curious circumstance. Uh, I was part of the Corps of Engineers in 10th Corps headquarters. And I was a sergeant at the time involved in engineering intelligence. So I landed on A Day on the island of Leyte in the Philippines. And my job was to find materials that could be used for building roads and other structures that we were going to need on the island. And I was traveling with an infantry unit and was into the island reporting into headquarters every day by one of these crank phones. And one morning, after we'd been on the island about three months, <laughs> And by that time, the combat had wound down. We were involved in kind of mopping up operations. I was told to come back to headquarters. The commanding general wanted to see me, the general Cyber. Now, when you're a sergeant, the commanding general wants to see you. That can only mean one thing, court-martial. So I couldn't figure out what I had done wrong that time. <laughs> so I got back to headquarters, cleaned up, and went to the general's office. And I came in, he had a stack of papers in front of me. And he said, Sergeant, he said, I understand you were trained as an architect. Is that correct? I said, yes, sir. He said, where were you trained? So I told him. He said, did you ever practice architecture before you got in the Army? I said, yes, sir. How long? I told him. Where? What kind of things did you do? I had no idea what he was driving at. Then he said, did you ever do any architecture in the military? I said, yes. I spent a year and a half in the Desert Training Center. What did you build there? I told him what I built there. He said, good. He said, I need an architect. He said, we're winding down here now, and we have a lot of tired troops, so I want to build a recreation center to accommodate from four to 600 men at a time. So I can rotate through the troops on the island for periods of two to four days, where they can completely relax and have some fun. He says, I think I have an ideal site for it, and I'd like to take you there and show it to you. So this was at Tacloban, a little town on the north uh, east side of the island. And we walked out of the shed in which the headquarters was located down to the beach and got in a little LCI, a little infantry landing craft, and came around the head of the island. The island is kind of a kidney bean shaped island with a river running down it called the Barugo River. And we were over here, we took this little craft and came around into the mouth of the river and came down about a mile and a half or two, pulled ashore, and on the east side of that river, was a large open field completely surrounded by forest. It was a beautiful flat site right on the edge of the river. And he showed it to me and he said, what do you think? I said, it looks great. I think it's a marvelous site. He said, good. He said, this is where we want to build it. And he said, are you interested? I said, yeah, I'd love to do it. You know, anything to get out of the travel with that infantry unit on the other end of the island. He said, good. He said, can you start tomorrow? I said, sure I can if you say so. He said, okay, we'll start tomorrow. I said, fine. I said, now, uh, how many engineers are you going to give me to work with? Oh, he said, don't be silly. I can't afford any. <laughs> I said, well, how in the world am I going to build? I can't build this thing alone. He said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, I'll give you enough money to hire 250 natives. I said, I don't even know the language. He said, that's all right. I'll give you an interpreter. I said, but uh, it's going to be very difficult. I, how am I going to work with a group of 250 people with uh, no knowledge of them at all, and they don't know our construction methods or anything? <coughs> he said, I thought you said you were an architect. I said, yeah. He said, well, then work it out. <laughs> I said, all right, uh, what materials are you going to give me? Oh, he said, I can't afford to give you any materials. Now, I didn't quite say it, 
But what I meant was, how the hell do you expect me to build this thing without any materials? He said, how do the natives build things? Go find out how they do it. Well, when I expressed some hesitancy, he asked me again if I was an architect. He said, I thought you knew how to build buildings. Well, uh, I didn't think it could be done, but anything to get out of what I had been doing was acceptable, so I agreed. Now, the next morning, equipped with one interpreter and two MPs, I came around the island to a little town that was right over here called Barugo, the same name as the river. And through the interpreter, I asked them, I said, who are the best builders in this town? Now, the only buildings they have are shacks up on stilts, uh, built out of native materials. It was really primitive. And they told me there were a pair of men, brothers, who were the best builders in town. I said, where were they? They said, what do you want them for? And I told them. And they disappeared. A little while later, these two men came around and said, what do you want? They said, I want you to build me a house. I'll pay you for it. They said, what do you want a house for? And I explained that I wanted to see how they built a house. Well, they said, what are you going to do with the house when we're done building? And I said, you could keep it. So they signed on immediately. <laughs> the next week, I lived with them, together with my interpreter and two MPs, and watched everything they did in building a shack. Now, they used only three materials. They used the, uh, the trunks of coconut palms as the posts. They used bamboo for what we would call beams and girders and columns. And they used the long grass called deepa, which they wove into mats. And those were the only three materials they built, they used in building a shack. And I watched this very carefully. And when they were done, I had two problems as far as materials were concerned. The first thing I noticed is that every shack that had been up for a while lean. And I wanted to find out why. And they told me why. The joints, when they put two pieces of bamboo together, were tied by this grass. The grass expanded when it was moist. It loosened, and so things under a little wind would leak. So I decided we couldn't tolerate that in a big uh, construction job. But we didn't have to. It turned out all over the island was signal core wire. And so we did a little experimentation using wire to make the joints, and we found out we could produce absolutely rigid joints by tying them properly. The other problem I had is I wanted to put a dock on the river from which people could dive into the river and swim. Well, that's not particularly difficult, except the river rose and fell nine feet a day. <laughs> so I needed a dock that would go up and down with the tide, with a ramp going down to it that would be uh, good. Now, the big problem is how am I going to get a dock that will hold 200 people to float? Well, the answer to that turned out to be easy. There were 55-gallon drums all over the island. So by building a cage and incorporating them into the cage, I could float that dock. It would go up and down. All I had to do was anchor it so that it went up and down on poles, and it would move with the tide. Now, having solved those two problems, I went back to headquarters and spent about a week designing a facility. This was sleeping facilities, dormitories, playrooms, the big problem I ran into was that the main room had to be 40 by 60 feet, the indoor area. The outdoor stuff, baseball fields and that kind of thing was relatively easy. But the largest piece of bamboo you can get is about 20 feet. The average is about 16. How the hell do you cover a 40 foot span with pieces of bamboo that are only this big? Well, the answer, you know, is to build a truss. So I designed bamboo trusses. And when I got all this done, we went out to the area, hired 150 men and 100 women. The men went out to cut the coconut palms and the bamboo, and the women were set up in the field to weave the mats, which were used for the wall coverings, the roof, and the other uh, solid fillers between the structural members. And we began to build this recreation center. As we did, we developed an audience. By the time we were finished, we had an audience of one to 2,000 natives every day standing there watching. They just couldn't believe what they were seeing. Because when we built the truss, they'd never seen a truss before. And when we put the walls up for this building 40 feet apart, they were all standing there shaking their head. There was no way to put a roof on it. 
And when they finally saw the trusses go up on the roof, and then the roofing came on top of it, they were absolutely amazed. At the end of that project, the thing, when it was open, the natives went back to their village, tore it down, and rebuilt it <laughs> for what they had learned from it. Right. I learned what development meant in that experience. Why? I was more developed than they were. But what did development mean? That I had more than they had? No. Development is not a matter of how much you have. It's a matter of how much you can do with whatever you have. If I have two people with the same amount of resources, the one that can do the most with them is the more developed. If I have a person with a lot of resources who can't do anything with them, and another one with very little resources who can do a lot with them, who's the more developed? The one with fewer resources and the greater ability to use them. The paradigm of development is not John Paul Getty or, John, uh, or uh, Rockefeller or Morgan. It's Robinson Crusoe. Because he had nothing but his capability to use the resources that were available to him and to create a high quality of life. Or the Swiss family Robinson. Development is the ability and desire to satisfy your own needs and desires and those of others. Development is a capacity. It is competence. Now, that means the process by which people develop is education. Development is a matter of learning, not a matter of earning. Standard of living is not an indicator of development. Quality of life is. You can have a very high standard of living and be very poorly developed, and vice versa. For example, Suppose we take an Aborigine group in the wilds of Australia. Having selected them as the beneficiaries, we load up a bunch of planes and move down there a bunch of automobiles, refrigerators, dishwashers, television sets, VCRs, and all the rest of it, and give it to the community. Have we developed them? They're not one damn bit more developed. They have a higher standard of living when we leave, but they're not more developed. On the other hand, when a Peace Corps goes into a poor community with nothing and raises the capacity of that community to serve its own purposes, a Peace Corps member is developing the community without any resources. The more developed you are, the less dependent you are on resources. The more you can create resources out of whatever you have. Now the interesting thing about development is because it's a learning process, Nobody can develop somebody else. Uh, I wish our governments around the world realized that. No government can develop its population. The only way it can develop a population is the population. Development has to be self-development. What an organization or a government can do is encourage and facilitate the development of the individual, but it can't do it for them any more than it can learn for you. A teacher cannot learn the subject for you. You have to learn it for yourself. But what the teacher can do is encourage and facilitate your learning. Therefore, when we look at an organization as a social system and say its primary objective is to, is developing, what we mean is to encourage and facilitate the development of its parts and to encourage and facilitate the development of a larger system of which it is part. Then what does the development of the organization itself mean? Well, two questions. If the purpose of an organization is to serve the purposes of others, does it have a purpose of its own? Of course it does. Does the doctor have purposes of its own? His own? Doctor's purpose is to serve the purposes of others. That is his purpose. And that's the purpose of an organization. Then what does the development of an organization mean? It means an increase in the capacity and desire of the organization to encourage and facilitate the development of others. It is an instrument of its parts and the thing of which it is a part. 
It has no independent purpose. It is dependent in both directions. Now, given that concept, we begin to view organizations in an entirely different way. What I want to do is look at an organization with you from the point of view of society, from the outside in, and see how that transforms that view. And then look at it from the inside out and see how that becomes transformed. And what the implications are for management. They are considerable. Before I do that, let me just check. You got any question about what I mean by development and what I mean by automation? The view of an organization from without has become a very important idea, and it has a name. Uh, this point of view has come to be called the stakeholder theory of the organization. Stakeholder, not stockholder. The stakeholder is any person who is directly affected by what the organization does, inside or out. Now, to get an idea of what the stakeholder theory is all about, I want to ask you to engage a little bit of a imagine, imagination with me. How many of you recall the television series Mark and Mindy? <coughs> Mark, as you know, is a visitor from another planet. And I want you to imagine a visitor from another planet. But unlike Mark, he is unable to communicate with anybody on this planet. He can't communicate, has no common language. But he has a task. He was sent down here by his boss to find out. In our case, let's take a corporation for the moment. He has to report back and tell him what a corporation is. Now, he can't read any books. He can't ask people, what do you do? The only thing he can do is observe. Now, if he can only observe a corporation, how would he be likely to describe it to the man he's reporting to up there? Well. This is one way he might do. You say the corporation is an entity which is engaged in a series of exchanges. He says, for example, there is one group of people that engage in the following exchange with the corporation. They put work in and take money out. The transformation of work into money. Do you recognize those people he's talking about? What would you call them? They're employees in one form or another. They don't have to be people on the payroll. They can be consultants or advisors, but it's anybody who puts effort into the organization and gets compensation in return. So let me call them employees plus. says, now there's another group that has a very different kind of an interchange. They put goods and services in and take money out. Who's he talking about? Suppliers, right. Then he says to his boss, interestingly, he says, boss, there's another group that does exactly the opposite. He says, they take goods and services out and put money in. But he says, these goods and services and these are different. Because in here, something has been done to them which increases their value. He says, this thing is adding value. Now, who's he talking about over here? Customers, right? Or the consumers. <coughs> Now he says to his boss, these are the easy ones. He says, it starts to get a little harder from here on. He said, there's a group who put money in and take money out. <laughs> he said, now I don't understand this, but what I observe is, first of all, they don't take it out at the same time they put it in. That comes later. And the quantity that they take out is different from the quantity that they put in. Usually larger. <laughs> Who's he talking about? Uh, uh, More than that. Investors. All the creditors of a corporation. <coughs> Banks, the 
with lots of money, the investment houses. In general, these are all the people who provide credit or cash in one form or another, the principal group being the investors. Now he said, believe it or not, there's another group that does exactly the opposite. They take money out and then later put it in. Who's he talking about? Well, it's interesting that most people in business have difficulty recognizing that. What's the opposite of a creditor? A debtor. Well, who's the debtors of a corporation? There's one huge one. The banks. Where do you keep your money? In the bank. You give your money to the bank to hold for you. You take it out later, right? And they're supposed to pay you an interest on it. You're essentially investing in the bank. So a bank is a debtor. But what does a corporation normally do with its excess cash, you know? Short-term assets. They buy stock in other companies. DuPont owns most of General Motors. That's a common practice. So you have a lot of debtors up here, which are other organizations in which the corporation invests. It's now the investor in them. These are the investors in it. Now, says our man from Mars, I come to the really tough one. He said, I'll try to make sense out of it. So here's a group that puts goods and services in and takes money out. So why do I distinguish them from the suppliers? He said, well, for two reasons. He said, first of all, the goods and services which come in do not become the property of this thing. They get the use of them, but not the ownership of them. And secondly, whereas these people have no control over what that does, these people do. What's he talking about? Management. Hmm? Management. No. Leases? provides goods and services, and controls or regulates. The government? Government, exactly. <laughs> what are the goods and services they put in? Fire protection, police protection, water supply, streets and highways, etc. But you don't get to own them, you get to use them. And of course you regulate them. So from his point of view, government's a form of regulating supplier, taking money out in the form of taxation, rather than compensation for services provided, in most cases, and putting these inputs in. Now, this is called a, stake, a stakeholder view of the firm. The point of it is not the particular circles. A man from Venus <coughs> might see it differently. It's not what the circles are or how many. It's looking at the firm as a set of transactions with various groups that have a common characteristic. So somebody else might have different stakeholders. Doesn't make any difference. But once you have this, you can begin to do certain things with it. First of all, there are 12 transactions going on here, right? I got six groups and a flow in and a flow out. If you look at those 12 things that are occurring, you can identify the fact that a corporation does only two things, because all those flows are one of two things. Either they are consumption, that's one thing a corporation does, it consumes resources, it consumes labor, it consumes money, it consumes raw material, it consumes energy. And that's shown here, it's consuming. What's the other thing that it does? Produces. It makes consumption possible. Right? How does it do that? Two ways. How does, what are the two ways it makes it possible? Well, one thing it does is produce. It produces things to be consumed. That's this output. So it produces. But it also makes consumption possible another way, which is not widely recognized. Um, it distributes money. It's a system for distributing money which is, makes it possible for those who receive it to consume. So it's a distributor. Okay. Corporation
Reformation then does, in this view, only two things. Suppose we take the consumption made possible by a corporation and subtract from it its own consumption. <coughs> this difference we have a word for. Can you guess what it is? That's what wealth is. This is wealth. It's the excess of the consumption made possible over the consumption engaged in. Therefore, from society's point of view, corporations have two fundamental functions. See, I'm now explaining the corporation because I'm showing its function in the larger system of which it's a part. First, to produce wealth. <coughs> Business is an institution of society created and maintained for the purpose of producing wealth. That's one of its purposes. <coughs> this has been long recognized before the stakeholder theory of the firm. What this did was reveal the second function which was not appreciated before, and that is to distribute wealth. And what is the principal form by which it does so? How does it primarily engage in the distribution of wealth? You want to guess? Salaries. Salaries, compensation for work. Therefore, from society's point of view, I'm going to show you one of the primary functions of a corporation is to produce employment. Employment is the only way known to society by which you can simultaneously produce and distribute wealth. There are lots of ways of distributing wealth, but the only way we know of doing it, which simultaneously produces wealth to be distributed, is through employment. We can begin to understand the crises occurring in a number of countries today, and even occurring in the highly developed Western world. Unemployment is going up. You know, we've got it. It wasn't very long ago that three percent was considered to be intolerable in this country. We're seven and a half now, and trying to say it, think of it as a permanent state. But all the forecasts show it's going to increase by the end of the century for a number of reasons. It's considerably higher in Europe, and the official forecast of the EEC in Europe is it will be 20% by the end of this century. Now, there's nothing as destabilizing to a society as unemployment. You can't tolerate high rates of unemployment in a developed society. There's enough trouble in an undeveloped society. It will overthrow a government. Therefore, governments must intervene when unemployment reaches a critical level. <clears throat> and they must do it by creating employment. And what's the principal instrument by which governments create employment? <laughs> Nationalization of industry. Because they will keep companies going in order to create employment, in order to distribute wealth. The problem is they don't know how the hell to produce it. And therefore, they become wealth consuming organizations rather than net wealth producers. But the important point that emerges from all this is the recognition that the socialization of an economy is a direct consequence of the failure of a free economy to produce employment. To the extent that corporations fail to produce sufficient employment, Government is forced to take over the production function in order to maintain employment. It's the failure of capitalism that produces communism and socialism, in other words. So that we have today a growing focus on the problem of unemployment and the need to create employment under conditions which are very, very difficult. Uh, it would take a long time to go into them, but let me just mention a few of the, the trends that currently exist. In order for 
businesses to survive in an internationally competitive market, they have to be cost competitive. We have the highest cost of labor in the world, right? Therefore, labor intensive industries are doing what? Moving to less developed countries where they get cheaper labor. That destroys jobs. Those companies that remain and want to compete can only do it in one way, and that's by automation. And automation does what? It reduces the number of jobs. We're in an era in which women are increasingly entering the workforce. Today, about 54% of women, adult women, are employed. And about 50% of the total employed are women. And that's increasing. It will continue to go up. We are increasing the length of life and decreasing morbidity so that time away from work due to illness or death is reducing. All these factors are coming together to grow the workforce at precisely the time that employment is decreasing because of migration of industry out and automation. And that's one of the central problems of our society today. And if we don't solve it one way or the other, there will be major social transformations that occur. You can begin to see them occurring in England, which is further along that path than we are. There are people now who say that England is beyond the hump. It can no longer revitalize and come back into a highly developed growing economy. It has entered the decline of that part of the West. Okay, so that's one way of looking at an organization. You look at the military in the same way. I've only done it in a superficial way, but you can begin to look at it by identifying the various stakeholders, they'll be different, looking at the transformations that occur, and then be able to descriptively identify the function that it performs. For example, these are not proclaimed functions. I was working with the Minister of Education in Mexico, and he was trying to formulate the function of his ministry. And we're working on the higher educational system, the intermediate, and the elementary. We're talking about the higher educational system. And he said, the principal function of the higher educational system is to prepare people for professional activity. I said, that's the principal function from whose point of view? He said, well, from society's point of view. I said, oh, hell no. That's not the primary function of a university from society's point of view. That's a myth. He said, what do you mean? I said, all right, let me explain what I mean. Suppose you shut all the universities in Mexico tomorrow. What would happen? He answered with one word. Want to guess what the word was? Revolution. Why? For some there would be millions of unemployed people in Mexico. The principal function of the universities in Mexico are to reduce the unemployed workforce, and particularly among the educated, because they're the most dangerous. From society's point of view, that's what the function is. Secondarily, is the training of professionals. <coughs> and believe me, that same function is critical in this country. And with the contraction of federal support for higher institutions, the worry, you, know, you ought to be worried about unemployed professors. That's trivial. The real worry is the increased number of unemployed young people where the unemployment rates are already close to 20% and close to 40% among the young minority people in the population. We're developing a whole new social phenomena called the underclass, unemployables. And that's really going to be a problem going out. So these are among the problems we have to face which are being generated by the system's age, which we are still trying to solve by using the methodologies of the machine age. No wonder we're in a hell of a mess. Our survival and development depends on our ability to begin to approach problems generated by this age with methods made available to us by this age. And we're going to look at some of those methods as we go on through the day. Okay? Any questions about that? How about something? Yeah. <coughs> Do you consider services we have 
been said, or I understand it, you said that our country is serving, you know, we have transformed to serving each other more than we are, you know, uh, producing. Did you consider service and production? And it's definitely Very good point. You're right on the key question. Uh, 1926 was the year in which the largest percentage of the American workforce that was employed in production occurred. The number has increased since 1926, but the percentage of people employed in production has decreased continually since 1926. Today it's only about 19% who are engaged in productive activities where we meet our production and production of material things. Most other people are involved in services. The demand for services is unlimited. The desire, I'm sorry, I want to be very careful, the desire for services is unlimited. The demand is very limited. And the main reason is that the cost of services far exceeds their value in general. Therefore, the key to creating employment in a developed society is to increase the productivity with which services are provided so that the demand for them becomes commensurate with the desire. And there's an unlimited amount of employment available if we could reduce the cost of services. Let me just mention a few. Okay. In the city from which I come today, the cost of a public school education which produces more than half of its output as functional illiterates. <laughs> it's higher than the cost of sending a kid to the best private school in the year. That's unproductive. No wonder we get Proposition 13. The community in which I live, just outside of Philadelphia until I moved into the city a while ago, had a three-month strike of the trash collectors. People got fed up and they demanded the community go out and get bids from private contractors. The highest bid submitted was less than half the cost to the community of collecting its own trash. There's a book which appeared recently by the former Deputy Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, E.S. Savis. It's called Privatizing the Public Sector in which he collects cases from all over the countries in every public service to show how outrageously expensive they are. And says, unless those costs are brought down, we will contract the amount of service provided. That's what's happening right now in this whole budgetary issue. We're cutting back on the services provided because people aren't willing to pay their current costs. Therefore, the future economic health of this country rests on our ability to increase the productivity of the provision of services. Now, that's a big thing. How do you do that? That's not easy, but it's doable. You have a question. Yeah, well, my comment, and maybe you would like to comment, it, was a <coughs> standard of living. It seems that since World War II, uh, embedded in the <coughs> precepts has been everybody's going to look forward to an increased standard of living. But it just seems in the last three to five years, we've finally turned around and have agreed in certain segments of society to accept a lesser standard of living in order to have the jobs. Do you see that? Well, in order for something else, you're absolutely right in your observation. When we were looking at organizations as organisms, uh, standard of living was the critical variable. It was the measure of progress. When we look at them as social systems and development is their objective, standard of living is no longer the measure of progress, quality of life is. What we have started to do is sacrifice standard of living for improved quality of life. When we say we're going to clean up the environment, clean up the waterways, we're paying for all that. Paying for it is reducing our standard of living. But what we're getting in return, we say, is worth it. Okay? There's an unlimited amount of improvement in the quality of life out there for which we're willing to sacrifice standard of living if we get it at a reasonable cost. And we're not getting it at a reasonable cost today. As we start to become productive, we will spend more and more of our resources in improving the quality of life. Any other points you want to raise? 
Okay, now what I'm going to do is reverse the picture and start to look at the organization from the inside. <coughs> There's a fascinating evolution. We could spend a week on this subject easily, uh, tracing through the, the conceptual evolution of the attitude towards the employee by management. I want to take you through it quickly in order to get to some central points that we're going to explore in some depth. Uh, after World War II, it began to be increasingly apparent to managers that they were going to have to treat workers as human beings. They were reluctant to do so. So the initial efforts were, what's the least we can do to make them think we think they're human? <laughs> Uh, the most significant first step, of uh, which I'm aware, actually occurred in Holland, not here. And it occurred in the Philips Corporation, in their lamp factory in Eindhoven. Uh, their management had a very radical idea. They said, we control the work. Well, what is it that we control? They said, we control two things. The work he does and the environment within which he does it. Now they said, you know, we ought to reconsider. Suppose we let the worker control the environment in which he works, and we just control the work. I mean, after all, as long as he gives us the output we want, we don't give a damn whether the walls are painted blue or red, whether there's music playing or not, whether he comes in at 9 or 9.30 and leaves at 4 or 4.30, those are irrelevant as long as we get the output. So they developed a concept in which the worker would have complete control over everything in work that wasn't directly affected with the product. And that was called work structuring. Now, when Phillips introduced work structuring, where the workers have given control over the environment, they very carefully kept a record of what happened. And what happened was this. They plotted productivity against time. When they first turned this power over to the employee, nothing happened pretty much, because they didn't believe it. And they started gradually to begin to test them, like you know, let's repaint the walls of the locker room kind of thing. Let's change the menu in the, in the dining room. So, Productivity came up rather slowly until the work workers discovered the company really means it. We can do whatever the hell we want to with all this stuff around here. The parking lot, the dining rooms, the locker room, the showers, and so on. And then productivity began to soar. It came up almost linearly. They had a dramatic increase in output. Now, eventually, of course, after they finished painting and repainting everything and putting on the music and changing the work hours and relocating the clocks and so on, it leveled off into a plateau. Now, they're on this plateau for a while and several things are happening. The workers who had engaged in this can't think of anything else to do. A lot of them are retiring and new workers are coming in. And they're coming into a, a, an environment which there's nothing left for them to do. So what do you think happened? Gee, no. It started to decline, like that. Now, Phillips was very, very alert, picked up this decline. And at a point, long before it got down to where it had started, they called it off. They had an international event in which they put to rest the work structuring effort. It was a very dramatic uh, conference and symposium. Elton Holland had to be there to observe the weight of weight work structure. They came to the conclusion that if you're going to increase productivity, no single thing will do it. You're going to have to do a sequence of things. And that was a very acute observation. Because the next thing that happened was this. Observers of the workers said the real trouble with work structuring is it never affected work. It affected everything around work, but not work itself. The trouble is work is boring. Why is it boring? Because we have designed work for machines and given it to human beings to do whenever we can't get a machine to do it. The average work cycle was 20 seconds. That means you do the same thing three times every minute. 
60 times every hour, 8 times 60 times 3 every day for day after day after day and people get bored stiff. We design the work which dehumanizes it. We treat the employee as though we were a machine. As he gets more and more educated, he protests more and more, and he protests by reducing his productivity, alienation from work. So he said the real problem is to get rid of boredom. The first idea that emerged out of this is the way to get rid of boredom is to rotate the work, job rotation. In the late 40s, I used to work while I was a student in the university in the summers at a factory that produced electric cords. There are eight steps in the production of an electric cord. We had a, a production line. And each summer I'd come in, they put me in one position on the line, and I'd spend the rest of the summer doing that. It might be putting the plug at the end of a wire, and I'd put plugs on the end of the wire, you know, minute after minute, day after day, hour after hour, week after week. But it paid well, so I didn't mind too much, and it was only a short time that I had to do it. I came back one summer and they said we've reorganized the plant. Now you will start at the first operation one day, tomorrow you'll move to the second one, and so on. On eight consecutive days you'll do a different job each day. Job rotation. I've gotten a signal that the tape is about to run out, so we're going to take a stretch, not a break, okay? Stretch. <coughs>